morning, brothers and sisters, greet you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's certainly the place we want to be, it's in the Holy of Holies. Amen. They had the types in the Old Testament, but we've got the reality. Yes. Come into the very presence of God. What a tremendous opportunity this morning. I want to just welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May He bless every soul this morning with His own presence as only He can do. Amen. Let us stand as we read the word of the Lord. Um, thank you to the musicians and uh, song leader items. We just appreciate those things. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? I just think there's no better place than to feel His presence, to be where He is working, doing the things that He has promised to do in our day. I want us to read Psalms 122. And we're going to continue with the th thought we had last Sunday morning, Ground Zero, Jerusalem. And uh, just uh, trust the Lord will add His blessings to His Word this morning. <clears throat> Very powerful psalm, this in light of what we looked at last week in particular. Psalms 122, I'm going to read from verse 1. He says, I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, it's a tremendous thing. There are references, let us go unto the house of the Lord. But he is saying into, in our translation here, into the house of the Lord. It's not just to be around about it. It's not just to, it's to be absolutely in the presence of the Almighty God. Now notice what he says, our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. I want to say, if you don't have a love for Jerusalem, develop one. Because the scripture says, they shall prosper that love thee. Amen. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Let's just bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You for Your goodness and Your grace this morning that we can be together in this place like this to bring adoration to You. Lord, we are here because there was a time when You gave Your life for us at that city of Jerusalem. You died, You were buried there in a tomb, but You rose again on that great glorious resurrection morning. And the first day of the week, Lord, you made that announcement to those who came seeking for thee. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is alive. He is risen. Lord, and we serve a risen Christ this morning. A Christ who is alive, not only, Lord, as far as the record of history is concerned, but is alive in his people is able still to manifest the same power, the same things that was demonstrated to us, Lord, 2,000 years ago, but even the more so magnified in this hour. We're so grateful to you. May your name be blessed this morning. We bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, here we are as believers gathered together. Lord, that's what you were told us to do. Even the more so as we see the day approaching. We welcome you to come to take charge of the meeting, take control of everything that is said and done. May you receive the glory and the praise and the honor. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> I think as we uh, have been busy with this subject, I uh, just realized how the Lord had pre-planned and pre-done things in, in a very special way. 
we are so grateful for his mercy and his grace that has called us you know as we look at Jerusalem as we did last week we start realizing that God had a very special place for that city and that city is a type of the new Jerusalem for which he has a very special place in his heart because that's his bride amen new city a glorious city and I'm so glad that we can stand this morning and say we are part of that by his marvelous grace amen as we have tried to share with you just some of our experiences on our Israel trip I felt this morning to just start off the service um, with one more of those clips that we had as we said at, during our time there as believers together we had moments where we could just gather in the back of a, a church or something and just sing a song or two and I thought this morning just to share some of that with you um, sing that this morning. You know that means praise be to God. 
praise to Jehovah our King. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. As we said last week, what a privilege it is. And I think this chapter that we just read from just became so real to us. Scripture says, I will yet stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. And what a privilege to come there. And, and what is it all about? It's not just another tourist attraction, as we said. But to us, there's something very, very special about Jerusalem. And uh, last week, we, and I'm just going to run through a couple of the slides just quickly again we looked at Jerusalem as a ground zero and uh, recognizing that uh, we come to a time where this word ground zero has been used by many for different positions and different occasions uh, and from the meaning we saw it's the point of the earth's surface directly above or below which uh, an explosion occurs, especially a nuclear explosion, we took that principle, we started to see how Jerusalem became really the center of something that just ignited, has gone right across the face of the earth. It uh, is a tremendous point as we look at a central point of vast change. From there, watch the first day on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell at Jerusalem. 3,000 souls were added to their number. A couple of days later, the scripture tells us 5,000 more were added. Rapidly just expanding. Uh, it becomes the center or origin of a rapid, intense or violent activity uh, or change. And I think that that's so powerful when we start looking at what took place at Jerusalem. And uh, we started to look at some of those things. It's the starting point of something. These are all uh, really the definitions that are given to us for ground zero. Now, as we looked at those things, we saw there are uh, places commemorated Nagasaki where really an atomic bomb went off just at this point, just above this point on the ground. It became uh, a central point at the time <coughs> where they could say this is ground zero from here spread the the violence of what took place the the burning the fire the heat and so did we see that following that we had the incident in 911 with uh, New York the attack on the Twin Towers that finally brought them down to nothing but rubble and finally now a memorial set up in this place and as we said last time this memorial, it's, it's quite a thing when you look at it because 2,997 people died in those attacks. 2,753 as a direct result of the attack on the World Trade Center. And here we look at it and we see that in Jerusalem, one man prevented the obliteration of the entire human race. One man died. So that we can be saved. All those who would be prepared to believe on His name. And that name is Jesus Christ. That's exciting. I got excited last week. I want to say I'm excited this morning. Because there is a way for salvation that's given to us. And this happened at Jerusalem. The Lord could have come any place in the world. He wanted to. Amen. But He came to Jerusalem. Everything started at Jerusalem. Amen. We saw last time that this place then has great significance to the believer. And uh, the area that this photo is taken from is actually right up from the area where you have the upper room. As we showed last time, this is the area where not only did the Lord have the Last Supper, but also they waited in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come down upon the believers. And what a tremendous privilege that is for us. It was at Jerusalem that the first angelic appearance takes place. The scripture tells us John the Baptist's father was doing service at the altar of incense. Right in the temple. 
When the angel of the Lord came and stood to his right side and started to tell him about the forerunner of Jesus Christ coming. Amen. What a tremendous thing. The Lord chose the spot. The Lord chose the circumstances. Amen. And then I wanted to say at that time that's exactly what that temple would have looked like. Sorry, just one back there, Brother Edwin. That's exactly what that temple would have looked like. This is the temple in the days of Herod, a replica that's made of that from all the historic uh, information they could gather. And this is the kind of place that Jesus went to. Amen. This is where, when the scripture says he went into the temple and he taught, this is exactly where he went. When he went in there and chased out all the money changers and, and those who were bringing all kinds of trade and industry into the church, making money out of religion, that's where it happened. What a powerful thing. As we said, this is just the upper room where they believe this little church is built over the spot where they believe was the upper room. Amen. Outside was the house of Caiaphas just down the road. Uh, probably just a hundred meters or so down the road. This is where Jesus was taken captive. All of those things at Jerusalem. This is where the first church started. Amen. <clears throat> then we looked at the principle. And I just want to re-emphasize this. That Jesus Christ was not crucified inside the city walls. There is a place that is commemorated by the Catholics. That's uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I believe they call it. They also now have a Muslim mosque on, on, right on the doorstep of that. Uh, but that's not of our interest because the scripture clearly tells us that in Hebrews 13, had he suffered without the gate. Therefore, we realize that the place that we're looking at is none other than uh, Golgotha or the place of the skull as it is mentioned. Thank you, Brother Edwin. Uh, there, that's the most authentic place. Also, because of this, we understand that the place of burial is not where the Catholics have it within the city walls. But the scripture says where he was crucified, there also was a garden. And in the garden, there was a tomb. Amen. And that's, uh, as many of you may know, one more thanks. Uh, the place that we look at, well known as the garden tomb. What a tremendous thing when you start realizing what took place at this time. Amen. For the first time in man's history, somebody borrowed the tomb just for a couple of hours, really. Amen. Coming up on the Sunday morning. First day of the week, they came to embalm him. But what did they find? They found nothing but an empty tomb. There was no relics there. Uh, nothing left. One more, please, brother. I, I should tell you how many clicks I'm doing. Just go forward one more. Another one. Another one. All right, stone rolled away. Empty tomb. Amen. And we realize that this is why the Christian religion is so different from every other religion. Our uh, Christian faith, the first church started at Jerusalem, yes. But I want you to notice that the founder of every other religious system is dead in the grave. But this one, oh no, 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 my brother, sister, he's alive. That's right, brother Christian. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. There's something that excites our souls when we realize our, our Creator is also the one who saved us and He did not stay in a grave, but He rose from the dead. Why? So that He can be the same one that is living in and through us. Our God is not dead. Oh my, remember on the day uh, there in, 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 on Mount, Mount Carmel where uh, Elijah challenged them to a showdown. He knew there was only one God that's alive that can answer by fire from heaven. And he, told, he could taunt them. He could say, why? Why don't you scream a little louder? Maybe your, your God is on holiday, on some vacation, some trip. He's far away. My, our God has ears and he hears and knows and he smells a mouth and he speaks a God that is alive. Amen. And in Jesus Christ, that God was personified. The Word became flesh and went to Calvary and suffered for us. So that this morning we can be free. We can be alive. Because He lives. We live also. 
Oh my, what a privilege. Amen. Be not afraid. You come seeking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, but he is not here, for he is risen. Amen. There's two more there. Then we saw the streets just outside of the upper room. And I just wanted to say this morning, uh, if, if you missed last week, go back to it because I think it's an important stepping stone in our walk with the Lord because we realized that out here, the, the noise from the upper room started to come down in the streets. They started to hear there's a, a noise coming. People are talking. And they started to listen. What are these people saying? And one man started to say, well, I hear it in my language. I, I'm a Roman and these people are speaking Roman. Somebody else says, no, 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 no. That, I'm a Greek. I'm hearing them speak in Greek. They started to realize something very unusual is taking place. Why? Because that's the spot the Lord shows that the Holy Ghost should come upon His church. A church that is not to be just a religious system, not just a founded system of worship, but a, a system in which God Himself indwells the worshiper and brings a life to them. It's not just a, a set of rules. It's not just a, a set of con code of conduct. It's not just a practice of of traditional values and things. No, it's a living Christ within His church. Amen. Oh my, it couldn't be kept silent. We started to see how that they threatened the apostles and how that, remember that man that Peter and, and uh, John passed by and, and said, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, rise up and walk. He was sitting right at the temple entrance. They could do nothing for him with their old religious relics and ideas and all their traditions of men. But these had the power such as we have, we give unto thee, rise up and walk. That man's testimony started to move. He moved with the apostles. We saw how that they cast them in prison. The Lord comes. Another angelic visitation in Jerusalem. An angel comes down this time not to speak to John's father, Zacharias, but he comes this time to unlock the gates of the prison and let them out. And what does he say to them? He says, now you go down to the temple and you tell them all the words of this life. How powerful that is. Not just a doctrine. Don't just teach them certain things in the scripture. Don't just teach them about the life. Tell them about this life. Because it's life. It's not just religion. It's not just a place of worship. It's not just an event. It's life. Amen. And brother, sister, we are that church today. Amen. Amen. And remember, and I'm just quickly running through this. Remember, they had council meeting after council meeting. Finally, they cut to a point where they gently took them and set them again in front of them. They didn't know what to do with them because the boldness was there. They took note that they'd been with Jesus. But finally, Gamaliel, whom we know also was the, the one who taught Paul the scriptures, he stood up in the council. He said, brethren, don't do anything to these men. We have seen how others have risen up that we're just trying to pull a following after themselves. In every case, he uses two examples. He says, it came to naught, it came to naught. If this thing is not of God, it'll come to naught. But if it is of God, you may find yourself fighting God. Well, in their wise counsel, they still decided to whip them, beat them, and then let them go. And the disciples went on their way rejoicing that they could suffer this kind of treatment for the name of Jesus Christ. But we recognize that if we could have just woken up some of those people and said, have you seen what started at ground zero in Jerusalem? That glorious message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has gone plumb across the face of the earth. It has gone into almost every country that we have now. And here we are today, a people that are still believing the same original faith that was there declared at Jerusalem. I want to say this morning, we are still God-centered. We are still believing in one God. We are still baptizing in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the living Christ is still present with his people to do the same things that he did 2,000 years ago. And we are his witnesses. What a privilege. I love that part where they told the... Uh, the one more please, brother Edwin. When they told the... Uh, 
counsel the people you're seeking in the prison. They're standing in the temple. They're standing boldly. They're teaching. And you know, there's a boldness that comes when you really come in contact with a life. Amen. If you just join a church, somebody's going to persuade you some other way. You'll get cold. You'll get indifferent. But when you come in contact with that life, something changes. Something drives you. You can never let go of that no more. Amen. What a privilege. So this morning, I wanted to just continue with this a little bit. If you can give me another slot there. This morning, I want to focus on another area of Jerusalem. And that is the Temple Mount. The, uh, the place where we realize the Temple of the Lord was built and destroyed. I want us just to, in all of this, you know, I, I know it. And one stage as we were traveling back from Jerusalem on the flight, I'm thinking, well, we can put together a couple of slides and, and give a report back to the church about our trip to Israel. And then I realized, no, it is far more important that we see the value of the lessons that we learn. The place must come alive to us. The book, as we took the first sermon after we came back from Jerusalem, the first sermon was, the book is alive. And, and that's what it's about. It's a life. It's not just places you visit. There's a history, but it's speaking about something. And I want to say that the order of history has been dictated by God Almighty. Therefore, we realize that when we look at these things, we can see the, the spiritual lessons from the antitype in our own personal lives. I did touch on it last week. Jerusalem, ground zero. But you too have a ground zero in your own life. You must come to a place where the thing starts. Where like it did in the upper room, the Holy Spirit meets with you. We touched on certain principles, and uh, if you were here last week, forgive me if I'm duplicating, but there's a point at which the Scripture meets manifestation. That's ground zero. That's where it becomes not just a text, not just a theory, not just a doctrine, but a life. That's the point where it changes, and, and this is what's so exciting, because it happens in your own life. And as we look at certain things from the Temple Mount, I want to say this morning that we're speaking also about your life, the individual. And it's hard lessons that we learn from these things. This view over Jerusalem would be what Jesus looked at, bar that horrible dome of the rock, golden. The, the golden part of the dome was put on in 1963, just by the way. So Jesus never would have seen that. But he, he did know about it because he told us the temple would be destroyed and something else would take its place. But he would look across. This is from Mount of Olives, the top of Mount of Olives, looking down through the Kidron Valley, right across on the other side rises the hill of Zion, really, and uh, the first part of that is Mount Moriah, followed by Mount Zion on the, the peak on the, on the uh, northern and, and uh, western side, northwest, uh, coming to that great uh, place that the Scripture speaks about. And, and just by the way, where the church really started was on Mount Zion. Uh, you would go to the peak there. It's outside of the city walls. That is exactly where the upper room was. That is where the Lord met the disciples after His resurrection. It is the place where He actually let the Holy Spirit come on the church and the church started. Now, <coughs> as we look at this this morning, we realize there's been a lot of things take place. The Temple Mount, and these are just some things that we've borrowed off of National Geographic, they put out a very nice poster at one stage. 
So the first thing that was there is the rock of sacrifice, which they refer to. And this is the place where Solomon's temple then was built. I uh, just give you a little zoomed in picture of Solomon's temple as it was in its time. Uh, this picture does not do as the, f let me just go back one if you don't mind brother. Uh, sorry back another time. Amen. You'll notice there's an altar of sacrifice in front of the temple right to the right hand side of the picture. Uh, you'll notice that when you come to uh, the later temple of Herod, it is diminished in comparison to the size. But at the time of Solomon building the temple, that's where the sacrifices were being made. That's where uh, the routine and the principles that God told Moses with the tabernacle was really replicated in this building. The psalmist said, as we said this morning, that... His reverence to the house of the Lord is, and I want to read, he says, Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. He's talking to Jerusalem. Because of the house of the Lord our God. Now, this is what he's referring to. The Lord's house is here. Now, you'll notice... You have the outer court, then you have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place. In the most holy place, there is the Ark of the Covenant. That's missing in later temples. Now, this is what God's original plan was. The scriptures tell us that the glory of this house was so magnificent, and everything was so according to God's design that when they had completed the work, the presence of God come down in the place so that the posts were moved at His presence. And I want to say that we, the scripture tells us, and I, I might as well just uh, uh, affirm this to you this morning. The scripture says, ye are, in 1 Corinthians 6, ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the temple of God. Amen. And what is it? You know, the world today, uh, and I say the Christian world, if you can call it Christian world today, they say, well, God just takes what you bring. You just come as you are. You don't have to dress a certain way. You don't have to conduct yourself. God loves everybody. So God, no. God was particular about the kind of place that he would dwell in. He was so particular that he did not even want David to build it. A man after his own heart. Because God had something there that he said, David, you've shed too much blood. You've been in too many wars. I want somebody who is more of a representation of a peace reign. So not only the structure, but even the very hands that worked on it. God is interested in that. Amen. And God's not interested this morning in the leftovers and all the junk you want to throw at Him and say, oh, well, God, you just better do with what I'm giving you. No, there's a special place of worship. And it's because it meets with God's requirement that He comes down. I want to say the same event that this depicts to us happened on the day of Pentecost. After Jesus Christ had ascended, he told his disciples, Now, you go up there in the upper room. You wait there till you are endued with power from on high. And the scripture says they were there. And finally they got to a place of being in one accord. In other words, they sorted out all their differences. Because you remember in the beginning when they were just in the early church with Jesus Christ, they started saying, who's going to sit at your right hand? And, and who's going to be the big one amongst us? And who's the great one? And, and I'm going to be the spokesperson. And who's this? And who's that? No, no. You see, all of that stuff they had to iron out. And finally they come to a place where they're in one accord. The, the Spirit of God senses that unity. And down through there he comes. The same as he did in that temple mount. And comes in there with a mighty rushing wind. And demonstrates God's acceptance of the vessels that are brought before Him. Oh, it's so powerful. But, if you go to Matthew 24 with me, just for a moment. Matthew chapter 24. Now this was the pattern. 
It was built. And just before we read that, let me take this a little further. Israel, as much as God's presence was demonstrated here, as much as people could turn to this place and pray and God hear their prayers, we found that very quickly they got used to God's presence. They got indifferent to God's presence. And they started to follow after other gods. The Lord sends them prophet after prophet, warning after warning. This can't go on. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to cast you away. No, they just carried on. From the ten tribes who rebelled first against God, finally it becomes right to Judah. And the Lord says, I'm going to take away Jerusalem. You go and read the prophecies of Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and all those. They're, they're telling the people clearly, this is not going to be tolerated by God. And what happens is that gets taken away. Yes, we know it was rebuilt. But you know, after it was rebuilt, there never was another dedication like the dedication of Solomon. From all that they can find in history, when that destruction took place 583 before Christ, 583. From that time, they do not know where the Ark of the Covenant is. I know nowadays you have different ones say it's here, it's there, it's there. That may be so. But when they, in the days of Nehemiah and Esther, Ezra, sorry, when they re dedicated the temple there was no mighty presence come whooping down and saying this is it because there was something missing there was an ingredient that wasn't there and we realize it wasn't long after that and they were right back in the same condition in fact as we showed you last time that when this temple was built all of Israel was united under one head, firstly under David, then under his son Solomon, which is a type of Christ's reign in the millennium, oneness united together. But after that we find that they became dispersed amongst the nations and never since has Israel come to that place where they governed over all their land. In our generation, we saw Israel coming back in a far greater force than ever before to come to bring back that which was lost. So just about 11 years, I think, before Jesus Christ came on the scene, King Herod, who as we realize was not really of proper Jewish descent, became king over the Jews and sought to find favor with them. And he thought to rebuild the temple would really do something for their hearts. And he constructed this that we look at now, more or less according to the, the diagrams and the sizes that's recorded in Jewish history. This is what Herod's temple looked like. This is what we would have seen in the days of Jesus Christ. So when he went in the temple, that's the temple that he would have been in. Those are the courts that he would have moved around. When uh, he was found in the temple teaching the people, that's exactly where he would have been. Now Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, he went out of the temple, so he was well familiar with the temple. But you'll notice on this drawing, there's uh, lots of buildings on the foreground here. That's on the southern side, really, of the Temple Mount. All of this was added by Herod. So he, he kind of went to a great elaboration that wasn't there in the f Temple of Solomon. And uh, here we find now... Jesus is taken around by his disciples. Let's have a little tour of, of, of the Temple Mount. And, and they're going around, walking around. The scripture says, and they, 
It says, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Hmm? So what's he saying? This mighty structure that you're looking at. And this is really just the temple area. You'll notice Herod went double story it wasn't there in Solomon's day. Whatever he had in his mind, he just wanted to be bigger and better and try to impress. But the Lord says, not one stone be, will be left upon another. So that too would be done away with. Amen? Amen. And we know from history that 70 after Christ, Titus came in and besieged Jerusalem took it over and finally destroyed the temple. History says that they took the stones and rolled them, every one, off of its base until the only thing that remained of the temple's original part was the western wall. Which is why we saw last week that the Jews still come there and they weep and they wail and they pray because it's the closest that they could come to the most holy place. Since this Dome of the Rock, as they refer to it now, was constructed on the site, <laughs> over what they say is Mount Moriah, This whole area, and Brother Edwin, if you'll go back one for me, that is referred to as the Temple Mount, has been out of bounds to anybody but those of the Islamic faith. Uh, I remember, and I thank God for the opportunity, 1971, when we had gone over with Brother Willie and the family, we visited Jerusalem. At that time, Christians could still come and visit the site and move around on the Temple Mount. Jews are absolutely banned from it. But I don't know if you noticed a couple of days back, the newly re-elected president of Israel said to his fellow men, let's go walk around Temple Mount. And they broke all the protocols and they went walking around Temple Mount. Because there's a hunger in Israel to get back possession of this piece of ground. It is, by all description, counted as holy ground for three monotheistic faiths. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All of them have some kind of claims on this spot. But what does the scripture say about this that we're looking at? Let us turn to Daniel. Way, 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 way back. You see now, I just want us to realize something beautiful here. Is that we are looking at events, we are seeing things, we're, we're looking at buildings and manifestations, but I want us to recognize this morning, these things were already seen by Old Testament prophets. Daniel chapter 11. While you're turning there, I want to re-emphasize that we're not just talking about history or places. This is not a lesson in that sense. This is preaching. And preaching must touch our hearts. And I want to talk about your own Temple Mount. What did we just see? And Brother Edwin, if you will, just follow with me. One, two. From the top, Solomon's Temple, the Lord Himself came down. Pillars were moved. His presence was there. Scripture says they could not even minister because of the greatness of His presence. Then we had 
Herod's temple, which probably the best thing that ever happened to it was the presence of Jesus Christ and Him teaching in that temple. But finally, you've got the Dome of the Rock, which is a structure that is really pertaining to the Muslim faith. Today they have the Quran inscripted on the walls and all kinds of things like that. When I look at that, I realize that here's a piece of ground that at once was a hallowed spot. Like as maybe your body, as the temple of the Lord, is, is a chosen place. But you see, if we don't worship God, if we don't keep our dedication to the one true God, He tears down that representation. And some other shrine is built upon the place. Some other thing rises up and dominates over it. Something that never was supposed to have been there. And I want to say in the light of that, every one of us this morning ought to look at what am I doing with the hallowed ground that you bought back with your own precious blood. What am I doing with the hallowed ground that you wanted to put a temple up that men could look to it and recognize the presence of a God that's alive. Have I allowed it because of my unbelief? Because I want to follow after the things of the world? Because I want to follow their, tra their traditions? I want to be like them? I want to worship like them? I want to put up statues like them? I want to follow their entertainments? I want to follow their enjoyments? I, I want to follow their practices? I want to follow their way of living and dressing and whatever? It's torn down! And another shrine to something else. To other standards and uh, another faith rises in its place. Daniel 11 verse 27. <coughs> and no doubt Daniel could take a lot of study, but I just want to cut on to a couple of points here. Daniel 11 27. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table but it shall not prosper. Isn't that exactly the way the whole world has gone, the way things have been in, in, in the generations around us? Hmm? We see nations rise, they talk peace at the table, but they talk lies one to another. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So Daniel, what are you talking about? You're talking about the end time. The end shall be at a time appointed. Now, the reason we want to look at this this morning, remember Brother Branham says to us that Israel is your timepiece. When you look at Israel, you'll know where we are at. You'll understand something about what is taking place. Amen. Amen. Now, he says, the end shall be at the time appointed. Verse 28, then shall he return unto his land with great riches, and those are those who have occupied the territories. And his heart shall be against the holy covenant. Amen. And that's really speaking about the whole Roman system enriching itself out of colonializing of Palestine. And finally coming back to sit with all the wealth of the world, but not true to their covenant. Remember, he says, and... His heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Now I want you to notice this really, when, when you look at what took place at Jerusalem, is there was the first uh, coming, may I say, the annexing of the land of Palestine. But Jerusalem was pretty much left intact. You saw the temple of Herod. Uh, they even allowed Herod to play the role of king over the Jews. But by the time Titus comes back, he is coming with a, a kind of 
tyranny. He's coming with a different approach. He's, he's not coming to say, let's just govern them, take taxes from them. Uh, no, he's coming with a, almost like a revolt against those who are remaining in Jerusalem. He says, an arm shall stand on his part. Verse 31. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. I'm not a historian. But we picked up little bits as we went along. So after Titus, we entered really what they called the Byzantine era. So you found a lot of... Uh, places of worship built by the Byzantines. Christians, as it were, with some obviously uh, connections with uh, forces that are not exactly true to the original principles. They were the first, from what they can gather from history, that erected something on this site after the destruction of the temple. Some of the typograph or the actual setup, the design, the architecture of the Byzantine period is that the buildings are built with eight sides, eight corners, eight sides, as you see the dome of the rock. So clearly when finally the Muslims came in, uh, the Islamics took over at some point, conquered Jerusalem, they re structured this building and really followed the same eight-sided approach, which is different to what they would have done in their other places of worship. However, I just want to continue reading here. He says, they will then place the abomination that maketh desolate. Listen to the language of the scripture. He says it's an abomination. Where once Solomon's temple stood, now stands the abomination that maketh desolate. That word desolate in the original means it's to cast away. Amen. No matter what people tell you, respect this faith, respect that faith. I want to say this this morning. There's only one thing that's real and genuine. Was made aware of a little quote that somebody had put out and they said it like this uh, the issue is not about wrong and right because anybody can almost look at it and say oh that's wrong and that's right when we must draw the distinction is between right and almost right so you'll notice and we saw this in so many places Wherever the Jews had been, and let's just face it, the Jews were God's favored people before as Gentiles. That was the genuine faith of the Old Testament. It was the truth of the hour. It was the message that they should have followed. We came to place after place where there was something that was real, biblical, scriptural. You'll find that somehow... The Muslims have raised up something right on the doorstep of it, right close by. They also have a claim to something here. So the Dome of the Rock is over the place of sacrifice, the Rock of Sacrifice, which is believed to be the rock on which Abram was told to go and offer Isaac. But if you listen to the rendition today, from the Islamic point of view, it is the rock upon which Abram almost sacrificed Ishmael. Isaac, Ishmael. Just, just that little switch. Which is why you've got all this controversy. It's all around a lie. Amen? So the scripture says that it's going to be destroyed and they will raise up the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries, 
But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So regardless of what they do at Temple Mount, there is something that God will continue to do. And that's for the people who know their God, they will be strong and they will do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall and to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Amen. So now he's telling you that when this happens and this other structure is put up, it's not the end yet. And there's going to be lots of suffering for Israel. They're going to die by the sword. They're going to be burnt. They're going to go through all kinds of things. But the time is not yet. Amen. Amen. It's yet for an appointed time. And the king shall do according to his will. Verse 36. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Amen. Now the king you're dealing with here, that's still Rome. That destroyed it. That is actually the reason something else was built on the place of the tem temple. Amen. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. So what's he saying? This system under that king who is against the God of gods. Oh brother, sister, that's exactly what the Trinity is. It's an attack on the God of gods. It's an effort to displace the real, true, one living God that unmorphed himself into flesh and came and dwelt among us and to replace him with a trinity, the construct that came out of Nicaea under Roman Catholic guidance. He's against the God of gods. Amen. But he will prof prosper. When you look at the Christian world today, I think still the biggest denomination, Catholics. You go to Europe, that starts to make real, real sense. Because every second church you pass by, if not every uh, four out of five, Catholic, 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 Catholic. Talk to people, are you a Christian? I'm a Catholic. Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Catholic. What is it? They will prosper... Listen what he says. Shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Nor the desire of woman. Nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all. That's exactly what Satan did and he does that vicariously through the false prophet and finally incarnates that. I don't think Daniel slipped that in there by mistake. But he says that this man will lose the desire of woman. That really is the spirit that is now running rampant over the earth. When history has now spewed up its filth, you realize that these priests in the churches for years and years and years and years have had this same problem manifested. But he says it will run until a time. He says he shall magnify himself above all, verse 38, but in his estate... Shall he honor the God of forces? Mm. You see the new world religions. Just believe there's a God. But you don't call him a name. It's just there's a force. There's a power. There had to be some entity. They find everything. They just can't say, Lord, you're my God and your name is Jesus Christ. They just can't do that. The God of forces. The God of this, the God of rain, the God of fire, the God of this, the God. He shall, listen to what he says. He shall honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. 
Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall call them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Somebody makes money out of this divisions. That's what the scripture says. The dividing of the land, he does it for gain. You start realizing, so together and I were just talking about it this morning, how nations will build up armaments, they manufacture, but eventually, you know, you've got so much stuff, you've got to start a war. So you can get rid of the stuff and buy more, spend more, and constantly you find nation rise against nation, all kinds of things are done. Somebody is, is causing conflict and things, is splitting it so he can make money out of it. Right now, Jerusalem is in four quarters the Christian quarter, the Armenian quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter. And I want to tell you, there's so much spent on just keeping everybody at bay and secure and watch over this, watch over that. Somebody's making money out of it. He makes money. He, he derives strength from the divisions he causes. <clears throat> Verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now we know that that's dealing with the destruction of the Vatican, Rome. Brother Brandon makes it very clear that Russia will be involved, coming from the north, to destroy the Vatican. Like a mighty wind, whirlwind. Amen. He says at that time, the end... Of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he's really saying, the whole world gets into this kind of turmoil, overtaken by the king of the north and, and all those things. But there's a couple of people right around, a couple of nations right around Israel that's still preserved for a little while. Edom, Moab, as he says here. Children of Ammon. Now, if we can go back to Matthew chapter 24. We read there up to verse 2 where the Lord says to his disciples, Now here, see all this magnificent, magnificent structure. Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3, Matthew 24, 3. He says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, I should have probably brought that picture right back. But anyway, he's sitting there looking across the Kedron Valley at the temple complex. The disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Because this is major. We showed you last week how that when you look, maybe I should do that. Brother Edwin, if you'll follow me till you get where I am. There. That was the other way, sorry. Back, 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 probably about 20 slides. Uh, till you get the model of Jerusalem. One more, that's it. There we go. That was Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. Reconstructed model of the time. You'll notice the foreground, the massive part that they're looking at, is the Temple Mount. They've just been at this place. And Jesus just told them. We walked around there, you saw all this. 
but not one stone will be left upon another. This is major. This is a major destruction. They want to know, when's this going to happen? When's this going to be, Lord? When will these things be? Amen? When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Three questions. As Brother Branham shows us clearly, three questions he asks. They ask, he answers them all. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Now I trust you notice something. Jesus is saying to them something that it's not tomorrow, it's not next week. There's a lot of things that's going to happen. There's a lot of history going to unfold. Verse 9 he says, Then shall they deliver you up for, to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Amen? Amen. Right now, that is still present tense. Israel is hated of the nations. Why? Because they were labeled by the Catholics as Christ killers. Because of his name. They brought it upon themselves, yes. Because they stood there and said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Right? But they couldn't do any other because God blinded their eyes so that you and I can have a chance to see the light. That's God's great mercy. Now he says, Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now here he's telling them, when will be the end? Because that's one of their questions. And that answer is that when the gospel has gone to every nation, then shall the end come. Brother, sister, do a little bit of research. You will find that this gospel, and in particular this message, has reached almost every place that you can call a nation upon the face of the earth. There's a little, may I say, sparsity of coverage when you look at what they call the 2040 line which is a ribbon that goes around the world almost that involves the Islamic countries because of the fact that although they say we are a peaceable people you try to convert one of them to Christianity there's a sentence of death in many many Muslim countries why would they do that Unless they fear that when people hear the truth, their lie will be exposed. I'm off my topic. But Jesus is looking at this and he's answering these questions. Verse 15 he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. He says, the time's going to come. When what Daniel said, that abomination, they're going to put on the holy place. It's going to stand there. You're going to see it with your eyes. We saw it with our eyes. Brother Edwin, I'll count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, I think, 11, 12. The one after, you see the three, one more, and then. This is taken from a little chapel on Mount of Olives. Whoever designed it, I give them full marks. 
because they took the cross of Jesus Christ and they put that like the cross hairs of a gun all our hunters you know what we're talking about put it right on the place that is the abomination that maketh desolation and the only thing that can change that is Jesus Christ his death on the cross it's the only power that can overcome these evil forces amen so the Lord says you're gonna to come to a time when you will see this abomination that maketh us desolation you'll see it stand on the holy place I can only speak for myself the experience we had but you come and you stand there and it's just so wrong because you know that was the place God chose to have the temple and here's an abomination you know that's the way I look when I see a son and daughter of God that's not living the life you should be displaying the character of Jesus Christ you should be there as a temple to the living God but in the meantime there's an abomination that makes desolation he that reads let him understand the Lord says that thing's gonna stand there you're gonna see it now he's talking to the Jews because his disciples were all Jews at that time so he says you're gonna see this now we realize that already Israel was dispersed under Babylon and then come Titus destroying Jerusalem destroying the temple burning Temple Mount everything coming to destruction the Jews are fleeing across the face of the earth and by the time we come to the 20th century 1900 there's more of Israel in the rest of the world than there is in the homeland there's hardly one of them in Jerusalem but the Lord says you will see it and here comes the pressure here comes Hitler Mussolini here comes Russia all of those forces that started to persecute the Jews and they started to realize there is no free place in this world we got to get back to Israel and they get on planes and and whatever means they can to get back to Israel and when they get there they see the abomination that maketh desolation stand upon the holy place and inside of them don't tell me they're not grieved don't tell me they're not realizing there should have been a better building here there should have been a holy God revered here no doubt they can see brother sister I trust this morning that just maybe through a kind of history look at things that somehow you realize in your heart that if there's something that's a shrine that's built upon your holy ground that that thing needs to come down will it will it yes it will I trust my transition works the way I have it here because that's what's gonna happen it's gonna burst apart it's gonna be shattered and there's the golden gate the gate through which they believe Jesus would have entered into Jerusalem but I want you to notice this is probably the gate that Israel once opened more than anything else all the other gates of Jerusalem there's a whole lot of them they're open but this one is sealed and why is this one sealed this is exactly coming from the east the way you would approach the temple and you would come through this gate which is also called the Eastern Gate oh and don't we sing linger near the Eastern Gate because it's typing typology there now when you came in through this you would be coming straight into the grounds of the temple 
in the right approach to come past the altar of sacrifice, praise and labor, holy place, most holy. We sang this morning, take me in. But it's blocked. And you know why it's blocked? It's blocked by the Muslims. Because they know that the Jews believe that when their Messiah comes, he will enter through this gate. And that's the end of their game. So they decided to close it off. The Jews also believe that he will have with him Elijah. And according to their interpretation of that, Elijah is supposed to be part of the priesthood. And if he is part of the priesthood, he cannot come past all the graves that they have put there because he's not supposed to touch a dead thing. So they have put a Muslim graveyard in front of the gate. So I got news for them. The risen Christ just stepped into the room where his disciples were with the doors all being locked. You ain't going to keep my Lord away from doing what he needs to do. Amen. This is a reality. But you know so many people today, they keep that area locked. Don't let him come in. Don't let him. If he does, you know, if I, if I did go to church, maybe I'll get convicted and then, 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 then that old shrine is pulled down. If I do open my heart to the Lord, then all those things that I've, I've built and, and valued, all of that is going to crush down to the ground. I'll have nothing of that left. Well, just think of what he will erect in the place of it. Amen. Just think of what he will restore at that. Amen. Amen. Some of these things I think I'll have to come back to tonight. But for now I can just say this to you. That Brother Branham says that Israel will return to their homeland. We saw that already. And he says they will, right there on that mountain, once again erect the temple. They will do it. This evening I'll bring you the quotations on that. Looking at this, how's my time? I will keep you a little over time, but not too much. Is that okay? Amen. This just do where you have the three structures, please, brother, just back. Um, The top structure, may I say the God-ordained structure, the first to be built on this place. Genesis 22. The name of this mount is mentioned twice in Holy Scripture. Two times. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. That word is really to test him. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Now hold on here. God wants to test him on whether he is prepared to offer Isaac. God knows he's not really going to offer him because he's going to intervene. And God could have just told him, listen, in your backyard there, there's a stone. Go and do it there. But he says, go to Moriah. Am I reading that right? Amen. And get into the land of Moriah. 
and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abram rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abram lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Mm -hmm. Three days journey on a donkey that goes a little faster than a man walking. Three days. I think a man can walk almost 20 kilometers in a day. Well, let's just say the donkey did about 20. Three days would give them 60 kilometers. About 40 miles. That's how far they had to go before he could see the place afar off. So God's not just sending him to the nearest little hill or here's a suitable rock. No, he says, I want you to go to a specific place. Ground zero. Go right there to Moriah. I want that place. Mm -hmm. And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. God's chosen place of worship. God had identified this ground. Brother, sister, I don't know if you realize. But God, in His types and His shadows, was not playing games. Way, 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 way before, before even Israel was in Egypt. God says, here is where you bring your sacrifice. Oh my, my. He says, we will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Do you realize that Isaac there was playing the part of Jesus Christ? Having to go to ground zero Jerusalem. There he had to die, be buried, resurrected and return to us. Like Isaac now is told, we will return. Amen. Amen. Oh, how do we know? This is Mount Moriah. Because if you go to Second Chronicles with me quickly. Second Chronicles chapter 3. Do me a favor. Let's first go, and I know this is quite a lengthy little piece I want to read, but I just feel I need to do that before we go there. Let's just go to 1 Chronicles 21, verse 11. Now you remember there was a time when David numbered the people, and God was not pleased. And Gad the prophet comes to David and says, You numbered the people. You're relying on human strength. Like you want to see how big your armies are and everything. You should be relying on God. God's not favored with this. There's punishment coming. You have the choice. Now he's, here we pick it up. So Gad came to David. That's Gad the prophet. Came to David and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee. Either three years famine... Or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee. Or else three days at the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. So God sends his prophet, tells David, you have a choice. Three years, three months, or three days. Famine. Your enemy is overtaking you. 
or the angel of the Lord causing destruction and pestilence come in the land. And David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. You know, that answer must have pleased God because the reason this pestilence came is because he was numbering the people, relying on numbers and men. And the Lord said, you should have been relying on me. Now he is told, you choose. And he says, I will not rely on man. Not man. Let me rely on the hand of God. Because God has tenderness. God has mercy. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Now, now those are, <coughs> he says, so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. They had just gained Jerusalem. They had just put it up as their capital. And here is the angel of the Lord sent to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld. And he repented him of the evil. And said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Hmm. A threshing floor. You know what is important about a threshing floor? Is that you need one flat hard surface. Like as you would have seen on the dome of sacrifice. Or the rock of sacrifice. Now, listen to what the scripture says here. He says, The angel stood by the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes. And saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven. Where? Ground zero. Let me just say that. Angel of the Lord hanging between heaven and earth. Just above this. Having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord, my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite. Here is Abram. Sent to a specific place, Mount Moriah. There you must go and sacrifice. Here is the angel of the Lord ready to destroy Jerusalem. He says to the prophet Gad, tell David, go to the threshing floor of Ornan, set up an altar, make a sacrifice unto the Lord. Hmm. Unto the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. Now remember, Jerusalem belonged to the Jebusites before. You remember, so we're in that area. But let's just keep leading. He says, And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Onan turned back and saw the angel. Now here's the Jebusite. Also look back. Right on his threshing floor. Here's an angel hanging between heaven and earth. Right? And his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. Isn't that beautiful? You know what a threshing floor is? It's a place of judgment. It's a place where you separate the wheat from the chaff. It takes some beating. It takes some smashing of the plant. But what happens is you separate the seed from that which is not seed. So that that which is of value can be placed in the garner. It is the step, it is the route to the storehouse to be placed in the garner. I want to say, judgment begins at the house of God. It is God's route 
to your putting away, to your sealing away, into His garner. It is the great harvest. Amen? Amen. At the threshing floor. Lord says, that's it. That's where you go. Amen. And Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. He's really saying, as, as it does tell you in Second Psalms, that he is saying, I want to buy it of you. Don't give it to me. I want to buy it. Full price. No discount. And Ornan said to David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good to his, uh, in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for the burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. Can I make a very political statement here? David purchased the mount of the temple, temple mount. Full price. No discount. You'll see in a moment. You'll see in a moment. Let's just keep reading. <coughs> Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. For I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. I don't know how often we read the Bible, but I just trust you just saw something here. The same thing that happened on Mount Carmel. It happened with David. God said, that's the place. Go offer there. When he got to that place, he did what God said. God answered by fire from heaven. When Abraham obeyed God, chosen place, come right there. When he was ready to strike Isaac with that knife, there was the voice of the angel on that spot that said, don't harm the boy. Look behind him. There is the provided lamb. It wasn't anywhere else. There was a predestinated portion of land. Ground zero, I call it. Now your ground zero. Come brother, sister. The Lord's not looking for somebody else and somebody else. He's looking for your vessel. He's looking for you to surrender. He wants to do it on that place where once the Jebusite was. Now there will be an altar here. Abram must have recognized the hollowed spot. Because he called it Jehovah Jireh. The Lord provides for himself or provides himself a sacrifice. Looking way down to Calvary. Way down to the cross. Way down to the Savior giving his life to us. But the Jebusite never felt no feeling. Never experienced anything there. He just went on with his daily business. But when David comes there, oh my, Amen. he obeys the voice of the prophet. He didn't say, why should I go there? It belongs to a Jebusite. Haven't we got a better place on Mount Zion somewhere than this? No. The Lord said, that's the place you go there, and that's where you do it. And when he did, fire fell. Amen. If you will do that in your own personal life, God's fire will fall in your life. God's fire will light you up and make you somebody you never were before. He will make you manifest His true deity. His glory will be seen in your vessel. Amen. 
He answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. At that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. What's he saying? He's saying he now made it habit whenever I want to sacrifice. I come here. I sacrifice here. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God. For he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. So he says, listen, whatever God said, the place he pointed out, that's where I'm going. I'm not breaking this. I'm not messing with God's angel anymore. Amen? Amen. Now, chapter 3, 2 Chronicles, chapter 3. Verse 1. Now watch out the scripture. And this is the second place. As I said to you. Mariah is mentioned once. In the life of David. Uh, in the life of Abram. Go to Mariah. I'll show you the hill. I'll show you the place. Now 2 Chronicles 3. 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. At Jerusalem in Mount Moriah where God sent Abraham that's where Solomon built the temple so if we have the rocks and they're laying there brother sister we came to a place just beside the western wall where there's all these massive rocks that you can see somebody just literally pushed them over the wall and let them drop down on the street below. The very stones that made that temple. The evidences are there. Right there. Listen, brother, sister. Now he goes on, he says, In Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Hallelujah. Ground zero. He brings it right to one spot. Abraham sacrificed Isaac. David bringing the place of sacrifice to the threshing floor of Arnon. Same spot. Now when God tells Solomon build the temple, he doesn't just say build it wherever you want it. I've got a place. I've got a hallowed rock. Now I trust you realize when I look at that and I see what's sitting there. Forward a little bit, Brother Edwin. When I see what's sitting there, it doesn't belong. I'm sorry, it, it doesn't belong. That's not what that rock was made to display to this world. It's not. You say, what's it? It's a piece of rock. It's a piece of ground. I've heard many people, they talk about, why do people fight about Jerusalem? It's all a religious thing. God said, I got a little spot. Oh, now, these guys, they've got to lay claim on it. So for them, the rock is connected with Ishmael. You see, and they run to, he was the firstborn. He really wasn't of the chosen vessel, Sarah. He came by a bondwoman. Sarah was the free woman. That was the one that God's promise was connected with. That's the covenant. You see, but now they interject themselves into this. So if you listen to their story, this same spot, Abram, David, Solomon, finally Jesus, Stands there and says, it's going to be torn down. They're going to do this here. They take that same spot. Ground zero. They say, yeah. This is the spot from where God started the creation. There's no record. There's no Bible. There's no scripture. Other than what they thought of way after Jesus Christ came around. 
This is the spot upon which God formed the first man. So Adam was there. Now, God could have done that anywhere. But I always believe, here's just Bilhidon to you, my brothers and sisters. If God wanted us to know something, He will lead us in the scripture somehow to be able to make that connection. We've just been able to connect Abram, David, Solomon to that spot. Right? God wanted us to know that. But if God wanted us to know that that's the spot from which creation came, and if God wanted us to know that's where Adam, He would have let something somewhere drop. You know, a lot of people in the message today, they think you need to reach out there to whatever is happening. You've got to read this book by this guy, and this guy is writing on the, the mark of the beast, and that one is writing on this, and this one is talking about revival in the end time, and you've got to get all these things. We don't need none of that. What God wanted you to know, God puts in the Word of God and He inspires His prophets to speak those things. You do not need to go to other faiths to find truths. But here's the reality, brother, sister. He goes to that very spot. In the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite. And he began to build on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length by cubits after the first measure were three score cubits. And the breadth twenty cubits. Now I want you to notice something. You remember when God said to Moses... Let the people build me a tabernacle, that I may come and dwell amongst them. He said, you build it so big, so wide, so long, from this material, from that. Now, when you start realizing that structure that first stood at this place, that Abram sacrificed Isaac, or went to sacrifice him, where God provided Jehovah Jireh, where David made the sacrifice to stop the pestilence in his day and recognize God's chosen place of worship. On that place, this building is built and Solomon got instructions. Am I reading that right? It says, these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed. In other words, he didn't decide, I want it so big, so wide, so high, like Herod did. No, no, no. The Lord said, so long, so wide. This is how you build it. Yeah. All those dimensions are known. And that's why the Jews are saying now they want to get on there. They need to get rid of that that's standing in the way. Because the time for their Messiah to come is near. And they need the temple back. And what do they want to do? Build it after the pattern? Octagonal? No, no, no. That was a Byzantine idea. God's idea was there in the tabernacle, prefigured, then in the temple of Solomon, by instruction, dimensions, everything. So what are they going to do? They're going to raise it up on the same basis that it's supposed to be done. What are we preaching? We're preaching about you and me. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God is particular about the place. In other words, your election. He cannot lose your election. He doesn't change his mind about it. And even though you have messed up and you allowed another shrine to be built, this morning I believe it's a time to shoot it down, Amen. to bring it down, Amen. and to open the gates to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Amen. that He can enter in and make a change in your life and erect the structure according to His design so that His glory can be seen in your life. Amen. 
these are types and shadows. God was so painstakingly putting those things out there so that you and I can realize you are the spiritual manifestation of his mind. The things that he has here depicted, he has so stayed with it. Paul says, we ought to make sure of these things. We ought to make full proof of what God gives us. We ought to exercise the gifts that he has placed within us. Everything. Why? Because God ordained it so. Amen. I want to say to you this morning, you're not listening to this message by chance. Yes. I believe God's got a purpose with a vessel. Yes. Is there yet a vessel this morning Amen. that the oil of God can be poured into? Is there yet a place where God can construct a temple to His glory. Is there yet a place that can be put upon a hill and shine forth across the whole face of the earth? Amen. We'll come back to a lot of these things. There's a lot of material here we want to share. But I trust this morning, you just realize that, that God selected, God chose. What is it about that spot? I started saying, and I can't even remember if I finished the whole story, but when I was 12 years old, we visited Jerusalem. At that time, that old building went back. We entered in. I think my mom and sister had to stay outside, if I remember correctly, because they have this thing of men and women being separated in their worship. Walked into this place. And in the middle of it all, there's just this piece of rock. That piece of rock upon which Solomon built the temple. That piece of rock where the angel told David, that's where you take your sacrifice. That piece of rock where God told Abraham, take your son. Take him to that place. Three days journey and some. God is not indifferent about your election. That's why he's speaking to our hearts. That's why he keeps bringing the word back to your remembrance. So that you can blast away what doesn't belong there. And bring him back. To the full place of authority. Amen. Very, very soon. And tonight we'll take some of the other things. The scripture and Brother Branham says about this. Very, very soon. Israel. Is going to return. In their full glory. They're going to believe two witnesses. Amen. That's going to point them straight to the Jesus Christ. That's calling in your heart this morning. Amen. And when they realize. That that's the one that we sacrificed is actually being our Messiah all along. Amen. Brother, sister, that's, that's finished for the Gentile. The Lord is telling his disciples, when will you're going to see that thing stand there. When you come back to Jerusalem, you're going to see at that time. He says, watch those. Oh, where's my scripture? I, I want to just pick it up from there just a moment. He says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Trouble's coming. Brother, sister, the tension. I said that last week. The tension around Israel between their neighbors, the people they share the ground with, is high. He says, Then let them be which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. This is the time when the great tribulation sets in. And you know when they get the great tribulation sitting in, three and a half years is still allocated to Israel in which they receive the Messiah. Where are you and I? 
We're going home, brother, sister. We're going home very, very soon. Very, very soon. He says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. Then if any man say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And is that not exactly the time in which we live? Everybody wants to tell you, God's with us. He's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. He says, don't believe them. Don't go after them. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Remember what I said earlier? Not just the problem between right and wrong, but between the right and almost right. Come so close. They bring, bring it so near. That it sounds so authentic. But there is one truth. Amen? Amen. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And that's exactly what we have seen already demonstrated here before us. The same Christ that has come to open the seals for us is the same Christ that must reveal to them what they need to know. We've struck the west. As the lightning comes out of the east, goes all the way to the west. Mighty thunderous work. May I say this morning, from ground zero, it goes right across the face of the earth. And then finally it comes all back to ground zero. And by the time that happens, you and I better make sure that we have taken our wings. That we have left this old mortal changed from mortality to immortality. You better make sure you're in the rapture. We're so close. Look what happened. What's he? Benjamin Netanyahu. Just come back. Now we walk the table mount, the temple mount. All of a sudden the United Nations calls a meeting. What's happening? Why? Not because they're walking on a world heritage site. Because they know what's in the mind. They know what's in the scripture. And they know at some point, somebody is going to say, break it down. Amen. Which breaks the whole code of what is a national heritage site or a world heritage site. It breaks the whole agreements that they have made with all Israel's neighbors. It breaks everything. But brother, sister, it's got to be broken if the temple's going to stand there. Amen. And will it be that? I'm not saying. But it may be that that will trigger all the nations. As the scripture says, will rise up against Jerusalem. Stands alone. Will it be? We're so close. Anything, anything can trigger us. Amen. I ask you this morning, what is erected? What shrine stands on your holy ground? Let us bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, it pains our hearts when we see the abomination that maketh desolation. Hiding from view your chosen place of worship. The sacred ground to which you sent an Abram, a David, a Solomon. Lord, you yourself, when you were here on earth, frequented the spot. Told of the destruction that would come and of the abomination that would be risen upon it. We see it. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem this morning. We pray for the return of what belongs to them. We pray that you will strengthen them. For Lord, we know that that which was done cannot remain. 
But your word says that it will be for a season. And then the seasons will change. The shrine of a false faith will be brought down. Because you will not share your glory with another. I pray this morning, Lord, across this audience, everyone. Lord, your word says to us, we are living stones. We are places that you chose to place your name. We are vessels in which you chose to pour your holy anointing. Lord, this morning I pray that if there is a heart here that has allowed another shrine to be built, oh God, forgive. We see the repentant Israel day after day wailing, praying at the western wall. Knowing sometime their prayers will be answered. I pray Lord for the same desperation in the lives of young men, young women, old men, old women, every one of us, child, old, Lord, young, whatever we are. That the power of the Holy Spirit will move upon that vessel convince us of the things that should be torn down and erect, Lord, something to your glory, something to your honor. We recognize we are, present tense, your ground zero. We are that new Jerusalem by your grace. We didn't become it because of our choosing, but because of your choice. Glorify yourself in your bride, Lord. Glorify yourself in us, we pray. We have need of you. Let not our heart miss your message this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Years ago, we used to sing a little song. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching, let's stand to our feet. Zion, the beautiful city of God. Just give it. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upwards to Zion. The... Let's sing verse one.
just wanted to correct this it was the leader of the party that the new prime minister is in coalition with who represents the orthodox Jewish people they were, went on a walkabout on Temple Mount there's a great significance you know for the first time we've seen what we've seen displayed in in politics in Jerusalem they have a change of governments I, I forget how many they had last year nothing wants to stay why somehow they had to come to a place where they forced into this kind of coalition because many are just secular they've got other ideas but God knows what he wants that caused a stir and I trust as we watch God's timepiece we realize very very soon it's all gonna be over may our lamps be trimmed and burning our hearts are ready that we can pass through the threshing floor into the granary where God wants to keep us amen the harvest is on the Gentiles soon will be taken out of the way what a privilege we have I feel this morning to sing in closing nations are breaking Israel's awakening the signs that the prophets were told we see it Jesus said you're gonna see it when you see it no times coming here they come back in their homeland there's this monstrosity sitting at the most holy place in Israel ground zero watch the spot by God's grace hallelujah